My name is Dennis Hoover, editor of the Review of Faith and International Affairs, and I'll serve as the moderator on today's call. Our topic today, framing religious tolerance as a national security issue in U.S.-Pakistan relations, is particularly timely for at least three reasons. First, as the horrific attack on Tuesday at a police college in Pakistan reminds us, Pakistan frequently illustrates how lack of religious freedom and presence of violence are often correlated. Second, U.S. relations with Pakistan have become increasingly strained, which, among other things, raises the stakes in the coming U.S. presidential election and transition period. And finally, today, October 27, is actually a religious freedom anniversary. Admittedly, it's not exactly a commonly known holiday, but nonetheless, today is officially International Religious Freedom Day, observed on October 27, because it was on October 27, 1998, that Congress passed the International Religious Freedom Act. Now, joining us today to discuss religious tolerance and security issues in Pakistan is Lisa Curtis, Senior Research Fellow on South Asia in the Asian Studies Center of the Heritage Foundation. Her research has centered on U.S.-India Strategic and Defense Partnership, U.S. counterterrorism policies in Afghanistan and Pakistan, and trends in Islamist extremism and religious freedom throughout the region. She has testified before Congress on 18 occasions on these topics and has appeared on major broadcast networks, including CNN, Fox News, CBS, MSNBC, PBS, BBC, and her commentaries have appeared in The Wall Street Journal, Newsweek, U.S. News & World Report, Foreign Policy, The National Interest, and more. Before joining Heritage in August 2006, she spent 16 years working for the U.S. government on South Asian issues. She's been a professional staff member of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, a White House-appointed senior advisor to the Assistant Secretary of State for South Asian Affairs, and she's been an analyst at the CIA and served as a diplomat in the U.S. embassies in Pakistan and India. Now, before I turn the mic over to Lisa, just a few quick words on today's call format. We'll begin with about 20 minutes of remarks from Lisa, and then we'll open the floor for your questions. If you'd like to ask a question, please press 5 star at any point during the call, and you'll be placed in the queue. Please also note that this call is on the record, and an audio recording will be made available on the IGE website. So with that introduction, let's turn now to our call. Thanks again, Lisa, for joining us today. The floor is yours. Well, thank you, Dennis, for that introduction, and thanks to the Institute for Global Engagement, Engagement for uh, hosting this call today on such an important topic, and thanks to you all who are on the line uh, for listening in. Uh, so as in several countries across the world, especially where al-Qaeda and ISIS operate or where Islamist ideologies are proliferating, uh, religious persecution and religious intolerance are on the rise in Pakistan. The targets are Christians, their Ahmadis, Hindus, even the Shia Muslim minority community. <clears throat> now, Pakistan was originally established in 1947 as a homeland for Muslims, but the country's founding father, Muhammad Ali Jinnah, uh, or Qaidi Azam, as he's referred to, the great leader, he supported the idea of Islam serving as a unifying, not a dividing force, and his vision for the country was one of a functioning multi-ethnic and multi-religious democracy. Uh, he believed that Pakistanis had a responsibility to uphold the principles of religious freedom and to protect the rights of religious minorities. However, soon after the creation of Pakistan, and unfortunately his untimely death a year after partition of the subcontinent, debate about the role of religion in the country's governing institutions was increasingly influenced by this idea that Islamic principles should inform the conduct of the state. Um, also impacting uh, religious freedom in Pakistan has been the strategic environment that Pakistan finds itself in and, that, and, and how it has responded to those challenges. Um, also impacting the situation um, is the fact that Pakistan uh, has not fully developed its civilian institutions, and both civilian and military leaders have failed to uphold the rule of law against certain religious extremists. Um, and all of this is, uh, you know, why the situation in Pakistan has become so problematic with regard to religious freedom. But certainly the most damage was done by military dictator General Zia Huq in the 1980s. 
um, as part of his campaign to Islamize uh, Pakistani society, he strengthened blasphemy laws uh, by making it a capital offense uh, to commit blasphemy. He incorporated anti amity provisions into the Pakistani Penal Code, and he also expanded the madrasa network. These are the religious schools um, that were turning out Mujahideen to fight against the Soviets in Afghanistan. So all of this has contributed to uh, the, the uh, religious freedom problems in Pakistan today. So 95% of Pakistan's population is Muslim. And of that 95%, about 20 to 25% are Shia Muslim. About 2% of the population is Christ Christian. Another 2% is Ahmadi. Um, of course, Ahmadi is a sect of Islam, although Pakistani laws do not allow Ahmadis to identify themselves as Muslim. Uh, and the rest of the population, the rest of the 1 to 2 percent, are made up of Hindus, Parsi, Sikhs, Buddhists, and others. Now, I should mention that there are reserved seats for religious minority members in both Pakistan's national and provincial assemblies. Uh, there are 10 seats reserved for li religious minorities in the National Assembly and four in the Senate. And in addition, there are seats reserved in each of the provincial assemblies. Still, the U.S. Commission on International Religious Freedom has recommended for the past 14 years in its annual reports that Pakistan be designated a country of particular concern, or a CPC as they call it, for egregious violations of religious freedom and belief. Um, so let's talk about the Christian community. Christians in Pakistan uh, are increasingly facing discrimination, persecution, and violent attacks. Um, you might have seen the, the Easter Day terrorist attack at a park in Lahore. Uh, that occurred in March. Uh, it was specifically directed at the Christian community, even though mostly Muslims died in the attack. Uh, there was 200, or 72 people were killed in that attack, and nearly half of these were young children. And in fact, this was the third major attack against Christians in Pakistan in recent years. Um, last year in March 2015, just a year before, uh, two churches were bombed. And in September 2013, a suicide bombing at a church in Peshawar killed nearly 80. Now, the most high-profile case of religious persecution against Christians would be that of Asiya Bibi, who is the mother of five, who was charged with committing blasphemy and was actually sentenced to death uh, in October 20. Or she was sentenced to death um, after she was charged for sharing a water bowl with a Muslim woman. Uh, and in October 2014, her death sentence was actually held up by the Lahore High Court. So the blasphemy laws were actually introduced during British colonial rule, but at that time uh, they were rarely used. It was uh, in the 1980s, however, as I mentioned, that General Zeal Huck tightened the legislation as a way to Islamicize the country's institutions. And today, there are more people on death row or serving life sentences for committing blasphemy in Pakistan than in any other country in the world. Under the blasphemy laws, uh, blasphemous acts include either making derogatory remarks about the Prophet Muhammad or defiling the Quran. Um, but these allegations are often fabricated or they're used to intimidate religious minorities or simply settle some kind of personal vendetta. And allegations do not require proof of intent or evidence. Um, and there are no penalties for making false allegations. So these are some of the reasons uh, the blasphemy laws need to be reformed. And the blasphemy uh, allegations have led to uh, several destructive rampages by different groups. In fact, in spring of 2013, a Muslim mob stormed a Christian enclave in the city of Lahore, burning down nearly 150 homes. In early 2011, Pakistan's governor of the Punjab province, Salman Tasir, 
and Minority Affairs Minister Shabazz Bati were both assassinated within a three-month period uh, because of their efforts to defend Asia Bibi and their efforts to try to roll back the blasphemy laws. And I think these back-to-back -back assassinations uh, were a clear demonstration of the extent to which re religious intolerance uh, is rising in Pakistan. But especially troubling was the fact that the murderer, murderer of uh, Salman Taseer, uh, the governor, his name was Mumtaz Qadri, he received broad support from within Pakistan society. And in fact, uh, several hundred Pakistani religious leaders signed a statement condoning the murder of Salman Taseer and warning other Pakistanis not to grieve for the loss of the governor. Now, Ahmadi Muslims, which I mentioned earlier, have also been suffering from religious persecution in Pakistan. Um, and this goes back many, many years. In fact, six years after Pakistan's independence, um, Islamists started a movement to declare the Ahmadis uh, non-Muslim. And they even called for the removal of then Pakistani Foreign Minister uh, Zafrullah Khan, who was an, uh, an Ahmadi follower. Uh, it's notable that Pakistan's only Nobel laureate is, a, is Ahmadi. But sadly, he's not honored within the country and, and is rarely even mentioned. Let me say a few words about the treatment of the Shia uh, population. As I indicated, Shia make up about 20% of the total population in Pakistan. And in fact, uh, Pakistan has the second largest Shia population in the world, um, second only to Iran. But still, uh, they suffer uh, persecution and increased violence. Um, and this has reached alarming proportions in recent years. Uh, in May 2015, for example, gunmen attacked a bus in Karachi, uh, killing 45 Ismaili Shia. Um, so the Sunni Shia sectarian violence has been prevalent in Pakistan uh, for many years, going back to the 1980s. And it's also been exacerbated by Saudi Arabia and Iran's competition for ideological influence in Pakistan. Um, and in recent years, most of these attacks have been carried out by a group called Lashkari Jungvi. This is a Sunni militant organization that wants to declare all Shia as non-Muslim. Uh, now, the Pakistan government has started cracking down on Lashkari Jungvi. And last year, uh, they eliminated the, the leader of Lashkari Jungvi, Malik Ishak, and over a dozen of his followers. Uh, but still, uh, the Pakistani authorities have blamed Lashkar-e Jangvi for this latest uh, horrific terrorist attack in Pakistan. This is the attack uh, that Dennis mentioned that occurred on Tuesday, where over 61 police cadets, Pakistani police cadets, were killed at a training facility near Quetta. Uh, this was a, a devastating attack, uh, especially since it occurred only two months after another attack uh, in Quetta, and that was at a hospital, and that left 70 people dead. Uh, but what's new about this latest attack is that ISIS has also claimed responsibility, and they even showed a photo of three of the alleged attackers on their new service, Amak. And I think it's entirely possible that ISIS is working with local elements of Lashkar-e Jangvi to attack the Pakistani state. Certainly, Lashkar-e Jangvi and ISIS share this virulent anti-Shia ideology. Um, and, you know, Lashkar-e Jangvi also probably wants to demonstrate that it remains capable of conducting attacks, even though its leadership uh, was decimated last year, as I mentioned. Um, so. It, it does look like there could be some ISIS connection to this latest attack, uh, but the investigations are still early and we will have to wait and see uh, what the uh, investigations turn up about this particular attack. But I will note that um, 300 ISIS uh, operators were arrested in Pakistan recently. Uh, so there does seem to be a, a recognition in Pakistan that um, ISIS may be trying to make uh, 
uh, inroads into the country. And I can talk a little bit about that in the Q&A if, if you're interested. Um, so not only has Pakistan cracked down on the Lashkar-e Jangvi, in particular, uh, the Pakistan military has been conducting a crackdown in the tribal border areas against the Tariqi Taliban Pakistan, the TTP. Uh, this is a group that attacks the Pakistani state. And actually, this crackdown had been showing signs of success. In 2015, terrorist attacks were down about 50% from the previous year. Um, so that's why an attack like Tuesday's is, is so troubling, um, because it comes at a time when you know we thought that Pakistan was beginning to make some progress against this terrorist threat. Um, and I think part of what's happening is Pakistan pushes uh, terrorists out of the tribal border areas and they go back into Afghanistan, um, and then they're able to regroup and then attack Pakistan from these safe havens. And this demonstrates the truly transnational nature of this problem and why it's so important for regional governments to cooperate uh, to end terrorism in the region. So amidst all this bad news that I've been discussing, there have actually been some positive yet very tentative developments over the last year. And I think you know, the signal that the government is interested in you know, slowly seeking to reverse some of the extremist trends in society. And I would say the most notable event, uh, positive notable event, was the government's follow through earlier this year with the execution of Mumtaz Qadri. This was the assassin of the Punjab governor, Salman Taseer. Uh, Qadri had tried to appeal his murder conviction, but the Supreme Court upheld the death penalty, and they upheld it on the grounds that objections to the blasphemy law that the Punjab governor had made did not constitute blasphemy and that Qadri had no authority to kill the governor. And uh, in their closing statements, um, one of the uh, Supreme uh, Court judges indicated uh, he spelled out what would happen if the court were to accept the arguments of Qadri's defense team. And this is what he said, um, and I'm quoting here. He said, then a door shall become open for religious vigilantism, which may deal a mortal blow to the rule of law in this country, where divergent religious interpretations abound and tolerance stands depleted to an alarming level. Um, and so despite street protests against uh, the following through of the execution of Qadri, uh, the government resisted the temptation to intervene against the Supreme Court's decision, which I think is very laudable of the Nawaz government. Um, and it, it, it's a very uh, bold step that they took. Um, now, the Supreme Court also agreed in 2015 that it would review the case of Asia Bibi. This is the Christian farm worker who uh, was given the death sentence for, uh, for blasphemy and who has been in prison seven years, uh, and apparently she is in uh, bad health. And of course, she faces threats from these vigilantes who may decide to take the law into their own hands. Um, but the Supreme Court did agree to review the case, although that has not happened yet. It was supposed to happen a couple weeks ago, and one of the justices ended up recusing himself from the case. And he, it, frankly, he was probably under uh, pressure, you know, getting threats from religious extremists. So unfortunately, Asia Bibi uh, remains in jail. Now there are a few other tentative um, positive steps that I wanted to mention. Um, one is the Supreme Court's June 2014 judgment directing the federal government to establish a task force and a special police force to protect religious minorities. And the Supreme Court's uh, direction to the government to develop a strategy for promoting religious tolerance. So we do see the Supreme Court uh, in Pakistan uh, trying to take steps in, in the right direction. Uh, and, and I think that, that provides you know, a source of some encouragement for the situation. So what is the U.S. role here? Of course, Pakistan is a major recipient of U.S. aid, economic and military assistance. It's received over $30 billion in aid over the last decade. 
Um, but we have seen U.S.-Pakistan relations become increasingly strained in recent months, particularly over Pakistan's failure to crack down on militant groups that attack in Afghanistan and India. So while Pakistan's cracking down on uh, groups that threaten the Pakistani state, it's turning a blind eye and even supporting, in some cases, other Islamist extremist groups that attack its neighbors. Uh, and indeed, the U.S. has cut some military aid to Pakistan uh, because of this continued support. So it's obviously a very complicated relationship. But one of the top recommendations that I and others who follow Pakistan closely have advocated is prioritizing the protection of religious minorities in our bilateral dialogue. And before Secretary Kerry's, uh, Secretary of State Kerry's visit to Pakistan in January of last year, uh, several Pakistan experts, myself included, wrote a letter to Secretary Kerry expressing concern about persistent attacks against religious minority communities. And the letter specifically called on Secretary Kerry to prioritize the issue and to make religious freedom a plank in the U.S.-Pakistan strategic dialogue. Um, the same group of experts wrote another letter nine months later, and this time to President Obama, right before Nawaz Sharif visited the U.S. and uh, essentially made the same points that we had made nine months previously. However, sadly, there were no statements related to religious freedom following either of these visits. Now, another area of focus um, has to be reforming the educational curriculum uh, so that it teaches values of religious tolerance and pluralism. Um, Pakistan is facing a, a, a demographic youth bulge, so this makes the need to focus on reforming education even more urgent. Um, now, I think it's also important for Washington to continue to support the overall development of civil society, Pakistan's democratic institutions, and also increase civil society engagement between Americans and Pakistanis. I was delighted to participate uh, five years ago in a civil society dialogue in Pakistan that was hosted by the U.S. think tank Convergence. But there needs to be follow-up to these types of initiatives because I think that they'll help elevate those voices of moderation in Pakistan and facilitate freer discourse on the issues of religious freedom and pluralism. And also important is continuing to monitor individual cases where religious freedom is being violated. Uh, for instance, Asia Bibi's case, uh, the U.S. has to sustain its public advocacy for the release of Asia Bibi. While I indicated the Supreme Court has taken a positive step by agreeing to review her case, the U.S. has to keep up the pressure for her immediate release from jail. But was, what's probably the most important step in tamping down uh, religious intolerance in Pakistan would be Pakistan's pursuit of friendlier ties to India. Sustaining dialogue with India and cracking down on those extremist groups that press an anti-India narrative would actually help stabilize Pakistani society and undercut support for all extremist ideologies. So in conclusion, I think rolling back this tide of extremism in Pakistan is an enormous task, and it actually could take a, de a generation. But there are some of these recent hopeful signs that I have pointed to, um, and I, I think you know, to accomplish the task, Islamabad will have to take a comprehensive approach to shutting down all Islamist militant groups that operate from its territory, not just those that attack the Pakistani state. And turning a blind eye to some terror groups ends up actually providing an overall conducive environment for all terror groups, and it allows the ideology that drives them to flourish. So I thank you for your attention, and I hope I've made it clear that protection of religious freedom is not only important as a human rights issue, but also as a strategic and security issue, since it has to be part of that broader narrative that seeks to counter the message of Islamist extremism. Thank you very much. Um, thank you, Lisa. Um, 
Wonderful, and I'm sure our callers are eager to um, engage with you on these issues. So we will now open the lines for questions. Uh, as a reminder to audience members, if you'd like to ask a question and haven't done so already, simply press. When it's your turn to ask your question, today's call administrator, Lindsay Kunz, will announce her name and unmute your line so that you can ask it. The lines will be placed back on mute immediately after the following, after the asking of the question. Uh, also note that uh, if you're already in the queue and for any reason decide you don't want to ask your question anymore, press five star again and your name will be erased. Finally, for the sake of other callers, I'll ask that when you're, when you're called upon, please immediately ask your question rather than providing your own commentary. With that, Lindsay, our first question, please. Yes, thanks so much, Dennis, and thank you, Lisa, for your comments. Your first question today is going to come from Jenny Ferris. Jenny, your line has been unmuted, so go ahead and ask your question, please. Uh, with regard to the situation in Pakistan, there's all there's been a lot of question about the role of religious parties and the way that and the perhaps um, outside influence that they may have uh, in terms of uh, the strategic relationship and and the inability of civil society to raise issues of religious freedom for fear of being further attacked. I guess my question is, according to the topic, um, national framing religious tolerance as national security, do you think a national security argument with these um, religious parties uh, has any possibility of, of getting uh, a hearing, or are they likely to just be so anti-West that um, they can't see the possible value that religious tolerance might lead to an overall more stable society? Great, thank you. That is a an excellent question. Um, so first of all, the the religious parties in Pakistan, the main main one being the Jamaat-e Islami, but also the Jamaat ul Islam or JUI, um, and several others, they don't tend to do well in Pakistan's elections. They tend to get maybe five or six percent of the vote. Although um, in in the elections, I think in in 2008 they did a little bit better than usual, but. Um, you know, they, they tend to not do well in elections. However, they still wield a tremendous amount of influence. They can get people out on the streets in protests. Um, they can influence the courts. Uh, they influence the political discourse. So even though if they're not serving in, you know, the parliament, they are having a, a, a very uh, big impact on uh, society and the direction of the country. Um, so your question about um, should the U.S. engage with these parties? Well, it's interesting. I, you know, I served as a diplomat in Pakistan in the early 90s, and we we did meet with the religious parties. But you know, it, well, we we met with the Jamaat Islami, um, but the the JUI at the time. Um, it was controversial whether diplomats could meet with them because they were actually involved in an attack on the um, U.S. Uh, information center um, in the late 1980s. So there had been a ban on U.S. diplomats meeting with that particular party for a long time, although um, I, I'm fairly certain that's, that's been lifted by now. Um, but the question always is, you know, you can engage with these parties, but then they usually, you know, turn around and continue to spout their anti-U.S. Um, slogans, and you know, they they generate their political support by you know being anti-U.S. So you often wonder, you know, is this really helpful in terms of engaging with them? Um, now that said, you know, obviously the the idea is to keep them as part of the political process. You don't want to drive them underground, have them turn to violence. So continuing to encourage their involvement in the political process. Um, but I think being very cautious about um, any U.S. officials' ability to influence change 
uh, within what they're doing. Um, so that's not a very satisfactory answer, but I think it's I think it's a very difficult question. I think it's an ongoing question that people are grappling with. Uh, you want to you know these these religious parties should be part of the political system. Um, they do represent you know parts of the electorate, uh, but at the same time, the the very um, you know, slogans uh, that they are benefiting from, the political slogans, are feeding uh, an extremist ideology. So how do, how do you convince them that changing, you know, their political slogans, some of their platforms, uh, you know, will benefit them? And I think, I think that does get back to your point about supporting civil society in Pakistan, those groups that are that want a more moderate um, progressive future for the country and so eventually you know for the civil society or grassroots has to put that pressure on the political leadership for change thank you lisa and thank you jenny for your question the next question is going to come from retired chaplain mark kidd your line has been unmuted please ask your question sir Thanks very much, and uh, thanks for the, the very interesting presentation. Um, near the end of it, you talked about one of the helpful steps in uh, reducing religious intolerance would be um, establishing better ties or improving ties with India. Uh, there was a prominent op-ed in this morning's Washington Post that talked about the uh, India-Pakistan relationship and written by uh, somebody by the name of Barka Dut, and I don't, I'm not sure I'm pronouncing that correctly or I'm familiar with that name, but it suggested that there may be less and less patience on the part of India uh, with Pakistan. So I'm wondering, as you think about that relationship with um, obviously the, the, the strategic weapons in the background of that relationship, what do you see as the, the prospect for better relationship between Pakistan and India uh, that would then help reduce uh, religious intolerance in Pakistan? Great. Thank you for that question, Mark. And yes, Barka Dutt uh, did a fabulous article. Um, I was tweeting that this morning, as a matter of fact. I thought it was very good and, and on target. Um, and, you know, warning the new administration that, look, it may have to deal with an India-Pakistan crisis as, as soon as it gets into place. In fact, we're, we're in the midst of the crisis. I think that uh, I titled my last article, you know, um, you know, things have settled down, but we're not out of the woods yet. Uh, the tensions are still pretty high between the two countries uh, following this attack on an Indian military base on September 18th in Kashmir, uh, which then uh, prompted the Indians to respond by a cross-LOC cross strikes against uh, what they called uh, staging bases for terrorist groups um, on the Pakistan side. Now, Pakistan has not, you know, retaliated to those strikes by uh, the Indians, which were taken on uh, September 29th, uh, but still the rhetoric remains uh, very shrill. Um, India just uh, expelled a uh, Pakistani diplomat for spying, um, and India's talked about other ways to diplomatically isolate Pakistan, such as, um, you know, uh, raising Pakistan support for terrorism in, at the international level, um, possibly cutting most favored nation trading status to Pakistan, um, perhaps building dams that might um, cause Pakistan problems in terms of water access. Uh, so, you know, there are a lot of ways that this situation could escalate both militarily, but also you know non-militarily. Uh, so I, I have to say I'm not very um, uh, confident that you know this situation is going to be diffused anytime soon. But I would say that the the, the fundamental problem here, uh, and this gets back to you know Pakistan and its problems with religious tolerance, is that the military establishment still sees these groups, which are driven or fueled by an Islamist extremist ideology, 
they still see these groups as an asset in their fight against India. So when tensions get high with India, you have less of an inclination to crack down on these groups, which could potentially be um, uh, be assets for the Pakistani state. And you you see this in um, you know, I think it, it, it could even relate to the case of Asia Bibi, who the Supreme Court was supposed to, you know, uh, hear her appeal uh, a couple of weeks ago, and it, it did not move forward, and there were, you know, threats about, um, you know, the religious parties, you know, holding protests if she was let go. And, um, you know, I think that the establishment doesn't want to, you know, crack down on these elements because of, you know, tensions being high with India and feeling like, you know, they may need to rely on these, um, uh, on these groups in their, in their fight against India. So, yeah, I think it's directly related. Um, unfortunately, I don't have any high hopes that India-Pakistan tensions are going to go down anytime soon. I think that the, uh, the military establishment is pretty dug in, in terms of their skepticism about uh, Prime Minister Modi on the Indian side, and um, their commitment to continuing to support these terrorist groups. Uh, so yeah, I don't, I don't really have any, um, <laughs> any high hopes there, but you know, the new administration is certainly going to have to focus on this issue and how we can use our leverage to convince Pakistan to crack down on these groups. Um, we can't just continue to uh, provide large amounts of assistance or just rely you know, solely on engagement. I think there has to be a mix of you know, incentives and disincentives uh, that we, we start um, giving to Pakistan. Thank you, Lisa, for that answer, and Chaplain Tid for your question. Um, Saba Ismail, you emailed me and noted you have a question. So I've unmuted your line. Let me know if you still have the question, please. Yes, hello? Yes, go ahead, Saba. Okay. okay. So my name is Saba Ismail, I'm actually from the civil society in Pakistan. I come from Peshawar, from the Cyber Pakistan region of Pakistan. Um, I, I have been hearing this discussion so far, and I think it's really, it's really interesting. It's really interesting for me because I'm a, I'm a woman's rights and a peace activist, and I'm working for promoting peace and countering and preventing violent extremism in the Khyber Pakhtun Hawk of Pakistan and working with young people or working with them um, to mobilize them not to join the, the militant, the religious violent militant groups, but to work for peace. So I have uh, one thing I just want to mention that the civil society of Pakistan do have the ability to, to work, but, but then there is the issue of uh, that when there is like a civil society which is more progressive or, the, or if, there's, if there are like people or individuals who are very outspoken on, the, on these issues um, in Pakistan, they are, they, they are being threatened and they are being killed. So um, I would like to know that what um, what is the U.S. stance on it and how you know they can um, work with Pakistan to make sure that the life of like um, of these uh, civil society activists who are especially working on peace issues is not is not threatened or they're not a threat to this country but they're working for this. Another point that I would like to mention because when I joined the discussion, the, the discussion was going on about madrasas and their role in in extremism. I would also like to mention that here, because I come from that, uh, come from that country and I have studied in, in public schools, um, but I was also taught about, about hatred, about violence, and uh, my role models in, our, in my school were like the people who were the warriors. So, and there was a lot of hatred towards non-Muslims and towards the people who, were, who did not believe in, in, the, in the Islamic ideology. So I think it's really important that we consider all, or, or the overall education system of Pakistan as a threat to the, to, the, to the growing intolerance in Pakistan. And one last thing about is I think there has been a lot of discussion between a relationship, um, you know, good relationship between Pakistan and India, and there is, there is, the, the, it is much needed, but I, but I think really most, very important is to have more um, relationship, like good relationship between Pakistan and Afghanistan. 
because, for example, as it was mentioned earlier in the discussion, the Tuesday attack on Quetta and uh, how many young people were, were killed in that. And whenever such incidents happen in Pakistan, the Pakistan military and army, they always there is like a huge blame game there, and they always like uh, blame uh, uh, Afghanistan and also that, for example, even in this case, they were like all the people get all the information and they were getting all this help from Afghanistan. When the school and the army public school in my city was attacked, again, the same thing happened that they were like, you know, all the instructions are being from Afghanistan. So I think it's really important because both the countries have porous borders. And whenever if there are like uh, on military operations in Pakistan, so usually the militants they seek safe shelters in Afghanistan. And if there is any military operation in Afghanistan, then they come back to to, to Pakistan for safe shelters. So I think it's really important that how these uh, the, the relationship between these two uh, countries is more like well established. Great. Thank you so much, Saba, and thank you for the important work that you're doing in Peshawar. Um, really, my hat's off to you, and, and uh, I really appreciate what you're doing. And, yes, I think that um, the U.S. should be supporting efforts like you're making. Um, the, the question is, you know, sometimes the U.S. can can actually be the kiss of death, right? So I know a lot of organizations in Pakistan might not want to take U.S. money or or be closely associated with the U.S. So, I mean, I think that's one, one hazard. Um, but at the same time, I, I do think there is still room for the U.S. to be more engaged with the Pakistani civil society. And I think that there should be you know, things explored uh, in this way. And when I talked about, you know, conditioning our military aid and, and you know, thinking about ways to, um, you know, have both incentives and disincentives, I would say that the, you know, economic assistance and the assistance for civil society programs like, you know, women's issues or democracy promotion or, you know, uh, promoting free trade, things like that, that should continue by all means, that that um, assistance that the U.S. is providing should not be cut off. I, I wouldn't be a supporter of, you know, declaring Pakistan a state sponsor of terrorism because that would necessitate cutting all of our aid, and I don't think that is a, a good idea to totally cut off the relationship. So I just want to make that clear. Um, but I also agree with your focus on the overall public education system rather than just honing in on what the madrasas are teaching because, you know, as you say, I know there have been new, numerous studies, one done by the U.S. Commission on International Religious Freedom that just came out in January of this year, which talked about continuing problematic uh, references in the public school curriculum against non-Muslims and sort of demonizing uh, people from the religious minorities or, for instance, equating, you know, a Hindu and Pakistani as being an Indian or a Christian in Pakistan, you know, being Western, um, these kinds of associations which, you know, obviously cause religious minorities problems in the country. So, yes, I agree with you. There should be more of a focus on the public education curriculum. So in terms of relations between Pakistan and Afghanistan, I agree it's not only Indo-Pak relations that, that need to be a focus, but also Pakistan and Afghanistan. Now, unfortunately, um, Ashraf Ghani, uh, Afghanistan President Ashraf Ghani, really did bend over backwards to reach out to Pakistan. Unfortunately, you know, things uh, did not, you know, work out in terms of, um, you know, he really went out on a political limb, but unfortunately, as he was reaching out to Pakistan, you know, the attacks by the Taliban uh, got worse and worse in Afghanistan. He could, he no longer had the political support to sustain that engagement uh, with Pakistan. He, he basically got nothing from it. So, you know, there was an opportunity lost there, I, I truly believe. Now, can that be revived? You know, I, I would hope so, but... Um, you know, so long as, you know, the Taliban continues to make gains in Afghanistan, and we've seen that they, they could hold as much as 30% of the territory of the country at this point, I think it's going to be uh, extremely difficult for 
for uh, Ghani to engage uh, with Pakistan. And, and like you said, this is a transnational problem. Uh, the groups that Pakistan has pushed out of the tribal border areas have just gone to Afghanistan, and now they're getting safe haven there and, and then attacking back into Pakistan. And so clearly there has to be some kind of mechanism for countries to together combat this problem so that the, the militants can't just, you know, go from one country to the other um, and sort of play off the tensions between the two governments because that's exactly what they're doing, and that, that is uh, a major problem. All right, thank you so much. Um, just a note to all of our callers, we do have several questions still in the queue. Um, it's 1.47, and we will end promptly at 2 p.m. So if we unfortunately don't get to your question, please feel free to email me via the same way that you RSVP, and I'll put you in contact directly with Lisa, and she can answer your question offline. Um, and just for the sake of the fact that we don't have that much time left, please limit your introductory remarks and get straight to your question. So this next question comes from Dr. Morthy S. Musu Swami. Your line has been unmuted. Please ask your question. Yes, uh, thank you for the opportunity. Um, first of all, I want to congratulate Lisa for a very good article. And um, I think uh, focusing on religious freedom issues is one way of uh, trying to tackle um, extremist forces in Pakistan. Um, what? Um, I think that uh, overall, uh, I'm in agreement with uh, what Lisa is trying to articulate here. Um, uh, but uh, we also have to be uh, acknowledged that um, the Pakistani government has actually tried to, for example, even reform the madrasa education, uh, and possibly it's uh, mainstream education as well. But the uh, religious leaders have stymied uh, many such efforts. Um, uh, the, the religious leaders in Pakistan actually get a considerable support from the public. Uh, that's the problem. For example, the 2013 Q report, uh, which conducted a survey in Pakistan, among other nations, uh, finds that 54% of the public support uh, the, the political role for religious leaders in Pakistan. Uh, um, so because these leaders are so powerful, they have also become influential. For example, the 2003 poll conducted by Matthew Nelson showed that 41% of the uh, public uh, prefer religious education for their children over elementary education. So, um, so yeah, the U.S. certainly can and should try to uh, persuade Pakistan to enact reform, especially in the area of education. But what we have seen in the past is that unless the religious leaders' role and their influence is somewhat reduced, if you will, it's going to be very difficult for Pakistan to enact such reforms. Um, so um, let's, I let's, think that... Let's, let's uh, there respond there, or if you if you got a more specific question, please, please get right. to so, it. Right. So, so the point here is that I think that uh, uh, the recommendations of people such as Lisa need to also focus on how to effectively Pakistan can address the the role of religious leaders in propagating uh, radical Islamist extremist ideologies. Great. Thank you so much, and uh, thank you for your very generous comments. Um, and, yeah, I think that's, that's a good way to put it. You know, how do you address the role of religious leaders in perpetuating uh, uh, religious extremist um, ideologies and viewpoints? Um, and again, I, I would come back to, I think you've got to separate the, um, the strategic issues here. And, and, you know, part of that is the Pakistan military establishment, security establishment, recognizing that uh, these extremist ideologies are, you know, harmful to the country. And, and I think there is growing recognition of this, but then there also seems to be you know, almost a blind spot when it comes to groups that are fighting India. And unfortunately, that perpetuates the power of these religious leaders. They, they get a lot of their power by, you know, harping on 
Kashmir and, you know, talking about Kashmir being the unfinished agenda of partition. Um, and, and so that, that continues. So I think until there is a decision, and the U.S. can't force this, obviously, it has to be a decision among Pakistan's leaders, but until there's a decision that, you know, look, uh, continuing to rely on these proxy terrorists in our uh, regional strategic objectives is going to actually, um, you know, cause harm to Pakistan, is already causing harm to Pakistan and could, you know, completely uh, destabilize the country until there is that, you know, the, the light bulb finally goes off or somebody finally acts on it, then I think that, you know, there's, there's going to be problems there. And, and uh, we haven't seen a change as such uh, within the, you know, key leadership in Pakistan. So I guess that, that would be my response to your question. Great, thank you. Okay, next question from Abjad Khan. I hope I pronounced your name correctly. Go ahead and ask your question, please. Yes, thank you. Uh, Lisa, thank you very much. I, I was very privileged to be among the signatories of the two letters that were sent to Secretary Kerry and have been advocating in this space for a couple of decades. Um, just one quick correction, minor correction. Um, Professor Abdul Salam was the first Nobel laureate, but not the only Nobel laureate. Uh, Malala, of course, won the Nobel Peace Prize. But, ah, yes, um, yes. Oh, you're right. Yes, yes, absolutely. But your point, the larger point is ex extremely poignant. I was in Pakistan last week, and I actually went to Abdul Salam's tombstone, and the word Muslim was erased from it, um, which is just an unbelievable tragedy. Um, so the larger points, of course, are, are, are really well taken. Um, there's so much I want to I want to ask you, but just to cut cut to the chase. Um, you know, this, this intersection between national security and religious freedom I'm, I'm extremely intrigued by. And part of the frustration um, in, in advocating and analyzing these issues is blasphemy is a toxic issue, as you know, in Pakistan from a policy perspective, internally, otherwise. And this pendulum of justice that swings wildly in Pakistan in dealing with this issue is, is very hard to contain. I, I, my question is around issues that may be less less toxic like for example but yet yet nevertheless very troubling for example for for Amadis, in order to vote in pakistan they have to disavow their identity so just imagine every mormon in america having to say they're not christian in order to vote that's the exact equivalent for several million Amadis in pakistan who don't vote and haven't voted in in many elections because of that very peculiar restriction that was passed in the musharraf regime in 2002 similarly in order to get a passport renewed in Pakistan, every Pakistani has to declare the founder of the Ahmadi community to be an imposter and, and disavow the Ahmadi community just to get a passport renewed. I mean, these are very basic citizenship rights issues that um, certainly can be, can be dealt with um, by the U.S. government in bilateral relations, but for some reason doesn't have traction. And the question I have is really why that is. Why is it that after all the work that the great work you do, 18 times testifying on the Hill, all of us have done in, in the past decades, why is it that we don't see a prioritization of religious freedom? And if, if the solution is to connect it with national security, how might we go about doing that? And I raised this issue a couple of weeks ago with the USERF chairman at the Council on Foreign Relations in a, in a attributable call and a transcript, and he agreed with that, but, but also noted that there's some pause to try to treat religious freedom as a national security issue because typically we view not, uh, religious freedom in the rights lens, and it's hard to kind of disassociate ourselves from it. But what would you suggest we do practically as, as all of us who are advocating in the space on the Hill elsewhere, how do, we, how do we raise this in a manner where there's actual solutions that we can glean? Great. Thank you, Abhijad, and thank you for signing the two letters uh, that, that we did. Uh, appreciate your support. And you're absolutely right. Um, that is my mistake, Malala Yousafzai, of course, um, also a Nobel laureate from Pakistan. Um, so, yeah, your question about uh, you know, what can we do to ensure that the U.S. views religious freedom issues through the lens of national security? Um, you know, what I hear from administration officials uh, in terms of Pakistan, I hear I'm just talking about Pakistan, when, 
you know, you try to say, you know, was Asia Bibi's case raised or, you know, was the case of um, Ahmadis and, and the restrictions that they continue to face, uh, you know, were these raised at the highest level? It, you usually get the answer that, well, we have so many different requests of Pakistan and that these types of issues tend to fall to the bottom of the list. They don't get raised. So I think that that's one problem. And that's why I'm actually advocating for viewing religious freedom not only as a human rights issue, yes, it's a human rights issue, but also in this era of, you know, Islamist ideologies that are um, violent and uh, intolerant, we have to also see the religious freedom issues as a security threat, as a security issue. Um, so, and I think once this um, connection is made, that they will be more willing to raise these issues, or these issues will you know, find their way up to the top of the talking points. Um, so that's, I think, our challenge in you know uh, trying to to um, get U.S. officials to increasingly make this connection. Um, so I'm not sure that we necessarily need any bureaucratic changes within the administration, um, I think, you know, is what, what we need is greater appreciation from the regional bureaus, say at State Department, um, and closer coordination uh, between, say, the Religious Freedom Office and the regional bureaus. Um, that, I think, is, is the most important, uh, important thing that we, we need to do in terms of um, getting people to understand that these are national security issues rather than kind of stove piping the issues. Thank you. All right, one lucky caller is going to be able to ask their last question, and then I'll turn the floor back to you, Dennis, to close the call. But um, I don't have a name affiliated with this number, but if you are calling in from 818-984-8866, I do see that you have asked a question, and I've unmuted your line. Please introduce yourself. Hello. Yes, we can hear you. Go ahead, introduce yourself and ask a question, please. Okay, hi, my name is Soraya Dean. Uh, gosh, I don't even know where to begin. I'm so passionate about this topic. Uh, I'm the founder of the Muslim Women Speakers Movement. Uh, I think uh, I'm a Muslim woman, and I think whether it's from Poland to Pakistan, the perennial problem we have is that we need to deconstruct some of our received theology. Uh, in terms of uh, the hereafter, I mean, much of the community is geared towards how to earn favors for hereafter. So there's a process of deconstructing that. And my vision is because I'm a Sri Lankan, and when I went to Sri Lanka two years ago, I saw a severe Islamization of my community. Women were all in a hijab. And I just uh, want to uh, touch on what you said, Lisa. Turning a blind eye aids the ideology to flourish, and it is happening in Sri Lanka. And I'm really concerned about that and how it, how it can connect to Pakistan. So I, I'm thinking how can we mobilize, create 100 malalas, to put it in simple words, how can we mobilize the women and teach them to deconstruct the received theology, uh, not in a way that is offensive, but uh, in a very progressive, positive way? Is there hope for that kind of education for the women? Great. Thank you for your question, and, and thank you uh, for the work that you do as part of the Muslim Women Speakers Movement. Um, and you're absolutely right about deconstructing the ideology and the important role that women have to play in that. And, you know, I think regional efforts um, that bring uh, the women together from all of the South Asian countries um, would be very, very welcome. And, you know, I, I know that there are examples of, of the U.S. engaging with women and in particular, you know, encouraging women to have a voice in the theological debates. Um, this, I think, is a, is a, a big problem uh, when it comes to the religion of Islam, that, that women are not, you know, playing the role that they should in some of these debates that you're talking about. Um, I, I think one of the most important, if not the most important things I did when I was a diplomat in Pakistan many years ago was participate in a forum where we brought um, uh, female uh, U.S.-based 
uh, Islamic theologians to Pakistan to engage with uh, the women there, the lawyers, the human rights workers, um, journalists, and others uh, to talk about some of these issues. And I don't think there is enough of that happening, um, whether it's um, people from the region, women from the region coming to the U.S. Uh, and meeting or, or you know, holding um, conferences there in the region and then, you know, really uh, figuring out ways that, that women can become more involved in these debates and more influential in these uh, theological debates. I think it's extremely important and, and I hope we can stay in touch and maybe we can uh, talk offline here uh, in the future I, about this. Thank you. I would love that. Thank you so much. Thank you. Well, uh, thank you. Our, our time, unfortunately, is up. Um, and uh, for those of you who were not able to ask your question, again, feel free to email uh, Lindsay, uh, and uh, she will connect you. Uh, thanks again, Lisa. An extraordinarily uh, informative and uh, fascinating hour of discussion on a very timely topic. Um, thank you also to all our callers for joining us. Uh, you can listen to the recording on our website and uh, also explore the archive of our past calls. Um, at the IGE website. Um, please also check out Lisa's recent article on Pakistan in IGE's journal, The uh, Review of Faith and International Affairs. And also, if you happen to be in Washington, D.C. on Tuesday next week, uh, please join us at Pepperdine University's D.C. campus, where uh, Lisa, along with Tom Farr and Judd Birdsell, will be speaking on a panel titled, Can the Politics of Religious Freedom Stop at the Water's Edge? to RSVP for that event. Uh, also, please uh, simply email Lindsay Coons at the same email address you used to register for this call. Thank you again, Lisa, and thank you all, and have a wonderful day. Thank you.